Uh, welcome, everybody. We're going to try to do the best we can and do a little bit of uh, math amid, amid uh, all the craziness. So um, can we get a, uh, let's clear the thumbs, thumbs up so that I, and the, and the smiley faces and the sad faces. Let's start with a blank face so that I know when, you, when your face is turned from happy to, to middle to sad and the thumbs go down or something. Um, let's go all the way back because it's been, what, a week and a half since we've talked about some pretty heavy stuff and there's been some pretty heavy stuff happening uh, otherwise. So um, let's go all the way back. What is a ring? So a ring. Can you write in the chats what uh, what you want, what you think a ring should be? What does a ring have to have? Yes, closed under addition and multiplication. Excellent. So closed under addition and multiplication, i.e. if R and S are in the ring, then R plus S is in the ring, and well, it's a group under uh, addition, so there is also something called a minus S, zero is in the ring, and R times S is in the ring, and all of our rings will be will have unity, so there's a there's an element one in the ring. Okay, the only thing we don't have is um, inverses. So the only thing that we, so uh, S inverse need not exist, need not exist. So far so good? Great. Examples of rings that we have studied, the integers, the Gaussian integers, Gaussian integers, the Eisenstein integers. So, can you write in the um, in the chat what W is or omega? Eisenstein integers. How is omega defined? What properties does it have? Yes. So one way to define omega is that it's e to the 2 pi i over 3. How about others? Other than Dipendro? Adriana, you were typing something? Well, what is this? At least give me one more as just a, the real part plus i times an imaginary part. Oh, you had a question. Yes, please. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Oh, just about the video upload. Am I recording? Yes, I'm recording. I'm recording the document camera. So this will be um, this will be posted as usual. Any other questions? So far, so good. Thumbs up. Thumbs up. Okay. So um, right. What's the real part of this number? Remember this W. W is if this is one. We're on the unit circle, and the definition of W is that its cube is 1. So there's W, here's W conjugate, also known as W squared. What's the real part of W? Can everybody write in the chat what the real part of W is? Great. Okay, well, I guess if one person writes, then the other people can just copy, but I do want to make sure you guys are, are with me, so please, yeah. Okay, so we got a bunch of minus a halves, 
And what's the imaginary part? So this is minus a half. And the imaginary part, what, what is this height? root 3 over 2. Okay, so it's a 30, 60, 90 triangle here to the point W. All right, great. So the Eisenstein integers are a ring. What's another ring? What's another example of a ring that we, what we spoke about last time? The Nordsome thing numbers. Um, I'm trying to think with that. Zia join I, yeah, we have Zia join I. We have the Gaussian integers. You mean the Therian ring? Is that what you're saying, Sarah? Yeah, that. We're going to get to the Therian rings in a second. Actually, is this paper a little too see-through? Let me get, let me see if I put some white paper under it, if that will help. I try to use scrap paper, but it's still, yeah, okay. We're gonna not use scrap paper since you can see this coming through, right? Um, Z join root five, yep. Z join root five it will, uh, is definitely a ring. The adjoint root minus five is another ring. Um, how about one more? Which we were algebraic numbers. Yes, the ring of algebraic numbers. Uh, we didn't really discuss that uh, yet, but that's definitely a ring. Um, there was one that we were definitely working through last time. When we started doing uh, long polynomial division. Yeah, exactly. So, so z of x is definitely a, a ring, polynomials uh, with integer coefficients. So this is all polynomials, a0 plus a1x up to a n x to the n, where all of the coefficients are integers. That's a nice ring. Um, well, it's kind of a nice ring, but actually there's no division algorithm in this ring because there's already no division in z. But, but another ring, another example of a ring, I think Kevin's gonna give us something. Yes, Q adjoin X. Okay, so same exact thing, except the coefficients, this is the same exact thing, except the coefficients AJ are now rationals. And that ring has a very nice property. So in general, if you have a field here, or for any field k, you could take the ring polynomials with coefficients in k. Okay, does everybody remember this? It's much easier to do very abstract things when I can see your faces and can tell what you're following and what you're not. So please, if you're not following something, um, stop me. Thumbs up? Nice. Okay, so that's what a ring was. Let's talk for a second about ideals. So review an ideal is a subset of a ring such that, what are the defining properties? Is that a hand, Stephanie, or just a stretch? No, that's just a stretch. You guys want to type in the chat what the, I think Karen's typing something. Karen, can I, can I? Uh... Right, closed under, so this is interesting. It's closed, it's closed under addition 
in the ideal and multiplication in all of R. So it's like a ring, i.e., for all, uh, what should I call these, n and m in the ideal, n plus m is in the ideal, n minus m is in the ideal, so zero is in the ideal, and for all n in the ideal and r in the ring, n times r is in the ideal. Okay, we remember this? Thumbs up? So far so good? Let's do some examples. Um, examples. So if the ring is the integers, what is the ideal uh, generated by, I don't know, six? Can we all write into the chat what, what the ideal generated by six is? So we're allowed to have six. We're allowed to have six plus six and six plus six plus six and six minus six is allowed. And six times any integer is allowed. Yeah, exactly. All multiples of six. So this is, this is zero, six, 12, negative six. This is just six times all of the integers. Okay, all multiples of six. How about in the ring Q adjoin X, what is the ideal generated by uh, X squared plus two? So does, does anyone wanna write in somebody? Let's put in the chat some, some element here. Okay, so one element is easy. Zero is always in your ideal. So if this is our ideal, I. This was our ideal i. So of course we have x plus two, uh, sorry, x squared plus two. We have negative x squared plus two. Who else do we have? Can, can, can you guys toss in a couple more elements of this ring? Of this ideal rather? Two x squared plus four, love it. 2x squared plus 4, how did she come up with that? She multiplied this thing by 2 because 2 is in the ring. Who else? Give me one more guy in here. Or oh, added two of them together. Yep, that's true. You can add, add this and itself, or you can multiply it by 2. Yep. Good point, Kevin. How about um, x cubed plus 2x? Is that going to be in the ideal? x cubed plus 2x, what did I do? Yep, I multiplied this by x. x is a polynomial with rational coefficients. Um, I mul this is in the ideal already, so I can multiply it by anybody from the ring. And that gives me somebody in the idea. Okay, so far so good. Everybody's following. All right, let's do a. Um, so, what does it mean for a ring to be a Euclidean domain? Do we remember this? Um, a ring. A ring. R is a Euclidean domain if if what if we want to do the Euclidean algorithm um, principal ideal domain will be a consequence of being Euclidean Yes, there's a division algorithm. Great, Joe. If there, if it has a division algorithm, if it has a division algorithm, exactly, exactly. So what does that mean? 
IE. So I'm going to leave a little room here, but then the, the consequence of this little room is for every element n and m in the ring, there exist elements q and r in the ring so that n is equal to qm plus r. That's just our usual division algorithm. And, well, and we get smaller. And we get smaller. And the norm of r is strictly less than the norm of m or r equals 0. But what is the norm? So there exists some norm function, n. The norm function takes values in the ring. Let's take away 0. Let's take away 0 and gives us natural numbers. OK, why did we want to take away 0? Well, remember, we were struggling last time with what we should make the 0 polynomial what its norm should be. And we said, well, minus infinity is a good norm for it. But that's, of course, not a natural number. So, so let's recall some norms. So examples. In the ring of integers, the norm of an integer is equal to, whoops, can't see. What's the norm of an integer in the integers? You can type it in the chat. N squared, yeah, N squared would work. N squared would definitely work. Um, yeah, absolute value, absolute value would, would work just as well. You see, it does, it's not uniquely defined, this function. All it has to do is satisfy this property. If you can always find whatever this whatever this thing is, all you want to do is be able to have it decrease and take values in the natural numbers. If you have any such thing, then the ring is a uh, Euclidean domain. Um, in z adjoint i, what is the norm of a complex number x plus i y? Great, everybody's writing in x squared plus y squared. So this now is norm of z squared if z is x plus i y. Um, why don't I just want to take norm of z here? Yes, Karen, great point. Karen wrote it in exactly. Square root of x squared plus y squared would be norm of z, but that might not be an integer. And I want the norm function to always give me integer values. So because the square root might not be an integer, let's just square it. Let's just do something simple, like square it. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Sarah, which is the same thing as z times z bar. x plus i y times x minus i y. OK, so far so good. How about in the um, Eisenstein integers? What is the norm of x plus omega y? Now it gets interesting. Kevin, you were about to send something? Yu Kong is about to say something? Complex norm as well. Yes, it's the complex norm. So it's x plus omega y times x minus omega y. Very good, Dipendro. Is this right? x plus omega y times x minus omega y. 
Right. It's not minus. It was only minus up here because that was the conjugate. The conjugate is no longer subtracting. Remember where, again, where W is. Here's 1. Here's W. Minus W is all the way over here. Minus W. That's not the complex conjugate. The complex conjugate is wherever it is. So it's not minus W, it's plus W bar. And as Dependro said, that is, so this is an exercise that either, we did this exercise already to work out what this is. It's X squared minus XY plus Y squared. Okay? Everybody remember this? Thumbs up? Any thumbs up? Okay, thumbs up, great. And finally, if we have some polynomial ring, x of, uh, if k is some field, k of x, then what is the norm? The norm of a polynomial a0 plus a1x plus a n x to the n, the norm of this is, you can all type it in, Remember what the norm for a polynomial ring is going to be? Degree, yes. Exactly, exactly, Yukon. So the degree of this is, you just have to type the letter N and hit enter. Yes, N, exactly. Okay, so the degree, degree. Great. So these are our rings with norms and these norms now there's nothing stopping us from making a norm on um let's do one more let's do one more here's our favorite frenemy of a ring the ring where everything goes wrong there's nothing stopping us from making a norm on this x plus negative root 5y is equal to well now the complex conjugate is just subtracting so we could say x plus root 5 i y times x minus root 5 i y which will come out to x squared minus 5 y squared minus minus plus 5 y squared there's nothing stopping us from making that norm but that norm will not have a division algorithm that norm will not have a division algorithm because the lattice this lattice, if you recall, uh, we have the point zero, this R sits inside the complex plane, we have the point one, and then we have the point root five I, so we have this kind of rectangular lattice, and if you remember, if you take some point way over here in the middle, it a, a circle of radius one around these lattice points will miss, will miss this point in the middle. I'm not doing a great job of drawing this. But I hope you get the, the idea. Okay, so no no division algorithm you might say, well Maybe we just weren't clever enough to come up with a division algorithm. That's just one way of trying to get a division algorithm. Um, how, how could we prove that there can't ever be a division algorithm on this ring? We have kind of a roundabout way of doing it. We're going to prove, so we will prove, that uh, Euclidean domain We started talking about this last time, implies principal ideal domain, which implies Noetherian. We're going to review all these all these topics, and that will imply unique factorization. So we're going to prove this chain of uh, assertions, 
And the last assertion is unique factorization, and we know this ring does not have a unique factorization. Right? This is the ring where 6 is a product of 2 times 3, and also 1 plus root negative 5 times 1 minus root negative 5. This is our favorite non-unique factorization. Noetherian implies unique factorization. Yes, we didn't prove that last time. We're going to try to prove that today if we, if we get to it. Okay, so this is, the, this is the chain of things that we're going to try to get to. So that's kind of a long-winded way of saying not only was our naive algorithm not clever enough to give us a division algorithm, there can't be a division algorithm. If there was, it would be a principal ideal domain, which also we can see directly that it's not, uh, which then would make it an Ethereum and would make it a unique factorization. Okay? So this is our like non-example of what we're trying to get to. So far, so good? Thumbs up? Thumbs up. Okay. Any questions? Let me pause for questions. How's the pace? Are you guys able to stare at a screen for, it's been about 20 minutes now? Everybody's okay? Do we need a break? You can write something in the chat. Okay, Sarah's typing something. And Karen's typing. You're allowed to type, everything's okay, keep going. You're allowed to type, please slow down, I don't understand these words, we haven't heard them in two weeks. You can ask a question. You can say, I can't see. Okay, Sarah, maybe not a question, but there can be anything said in terms of the size of a set of bijection between two sets that have the Euclidean domain property. Um, great question. Well, all the rings that we're, I mean, size in what sense? All the rings that we're going to be interested in are, uh, well, I'm about to say countable. But of course, if you take, uh, there's nothing wrong with taking the real numbers, uh, polynomials in the real numbers, which is a perfectly fine ring that has a Euclidean domain. So that ring is uncountable, of course, because the real numbers are already uncountable. Um, ah, yes, great question, Karen. Let me come back to that question, make sure I answered Sarah's. Um, can there be anything said in terms of the size of the set or bijections between two sets that both have the Euclidean domain? Yeah, so, Definitely not, because the integers have the Euclidean domain, are Euclidean domain, have the Euclidean property, have the division algorithm, and also, um, so let's make this a note. Uh, no, in general, in general, no bijection between rings, even if both have are Euclidean domains, Euclidean domains, and the reason is both the integers and the ring, which is the real numbers, polynomials in the real numbers, are Euclidean domains. Now, okay, we haven't in this class talked about why uh, the real numbers are uncountable. Wait, is this bidirectional? So if we find that it's not a unique factorization domain? Well, if it's not a unique factorization domain, see, Noetherian implies unique factorization is logically equivalent to not unique factorization implies not Noetherian. That's just the contrapositive. So same, in the same way, if you have a non-Netherian domain, then it can't be a principal ideal domain. And if it's not principal ideal, then it can't be a Euclidean domain. But the converse is not true. There are unique factorization domains that are not Euclidean domains. Maybe that's uh, what you're asking. Karen, let me come back to your question. Uh, Sarah, did I answer your question? Okay, great. So Karen's question, let's review why, why do z adjoin i and z adjoin omega have have division algorithms why do they have division algorithms i'm going to try to write slower but less sloppily 
How's the dot cam? Can you guys see what it says on here? It, it kind of makes sense, I hope. Great. Um, why do these have division algorithms? If we look at the lattice, z adjoin i, so this is z adjoin i, it's the square lattice. Because this distance is 1, and this distance is, is, well, 1, it's the point i. And here's the point 1 plus 2i, and so on. So we get this square lattice. And when we do the division, the division algorithm is trying to solve, trying to take a quotient and get a remainder. And the way we did this was we divided n by m. So we look at n divided by m. That gave us a, a rational complex rational. So wherever that happened to fall, I don't know, maybe it's over here somewhere. n over m is some rational number. And it turns out that what I want to do is take q to be the nearest integer. I mean, I don't even have a notation for this. Some nearest integer, nearest Gaussian integer, nearest Gaussian integer. which is not necessarily unique. And then, um, once I know what Q is, then my claim is that R, what, what will R be? R is um, N minus MQ, N minus MQ, also known as N over M minus Q times M. And so if this thing can be made, now I can take absolute values, which is our norm, or absolute value squared, absolute value squared, which is our norm. So this is the norm of R. This is the norm of M. And the point is I can always choose this nearest integer so that this distance is strictly less than one. Because uh, the farthest I can be from a lattice point, wherever my, oh, here's my n over m. There's my n over m. The farthest it can be from a lattice point, if I draw circles of radius one around the lattice points, those circles of radius one around lattice points cover up the entire space. The farthest distance is the center point, which is a half a half. So the farthest distance is a 45, 45, you know, this, this midpoint of this square. The midpoint of this square is a 45, 45, uh, 90 triangle with side lengths a half a half. So the hypotenuse is root 2 over 2. Not only is this less than a half, we can do actually better. It's at most root 2 over 2, which is less than 1. Does that ring a bell? Does everybody, um, can I get a thumbs up if that makes sense to everybody? Ah, ah, they can be of radius square root five. Excellent question. Great, 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 great question. So, so we're happy with why the, how this works in the Gaussian integers and it does the same thing in the Eisenstein integers. Let me just make that point real quick and then I'll come back to your question. In the Eisenstein integers, in the Eisenstein integers, now we have this a uh, hexagonal lattice. Here are the six points nearest the origin. There's one, omega, omega plus one, negative one. Uh, this is omega squared or omega bar, whatever you want to call it, omega bar plus one, and so on. There's this hexagonal lattice. And again, if I take circles of radius one around each of these, then I fill up all of space. I'll hit six lattice points here, I'll hit six lattice points here, and so on. Okay, so circles of radius one around lattice points fill all of space, or fill the whole plane. And that's why we have we can take this 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 idea of taking a quotient and a remainder 
and the remainder will have a smaller norm. Now one more example, before we get to the non-example, just to see the versatility of this, in our, our ring k adjoint x, I don't have a nice geometric picture for this. This is just, you know, uh, is an infinite dimensional vector space. You can have arbitrarily large degrees. But if n is a polynomial and m is a polynomial, n over m has a long division algorithm. This is, so polynomial long division, polynomial long division, it implies there exists a Q, which is a polynomial, which is in this ring, and a remainder, and a remainder in the ring, so that N is M times Q plus the remainder, and the degree of the remainder, and, well, or, and either R equals zero, in other words, N divides M, n goes into m evenly, and there is no remainder. And remember, the norm function doesn't have to have values on uh, on the zero element of the ideal of the of the ring. So, polynomial division, long division algorithm, long polynomial long division. Sorry for my handwriting. I, I'm trying to do better. Um, polynomial long division tells us there does exist a quotient and a remainder. And either that remainder is zero, or the degree of the remainder is strictly less than the degree of m. Of course, in all of these, m has to be non-zero. Did I say that all the way back at the... I didn't say that all the way back here when we discussed what a division algorithm is. Needless to say, but of course it's mathematics, so we need to say that m is not zero. Okay, so... Now to Karen's question. So far, so good? So far, so good. Okay, to Karen's question. Why can't we take uh, larger circles in Z adjoin? root minus five. Okay, why can't we take larger circles in Z join root minus five, like radius, um, you know, root five, did you say? Root five circles. Okay, so if we take radius root five circles, let's try that, okay? So here's my lattice point, zero, here's one, up here is root 5i, up here is root 5i plus 1, and so on. So we keep having these points. There's our lattice. It's kind of this rectangular looking lattice. Z adjoin root minus 5. Okay? Does everybody understand Karen's question? Can I get a thumbs up if you understand the question? And what the, yep, great, thumbs up. Okay, so. Why can't we take larger circles? So let's take larger circles. So here's a circle of radius root five. I guess root five is a little bigger than two. Well, I'm not very good at drawing circles. Uh, there should be another last point here. Okay, whatever, you see the point. So here's that circle. Now the next circle is gonna go like this. I mean, this is a terrible rendering. The point is these circles will indeed fill up all of space. These circles, will fill all of the whole plane. So why not use them? What's wrong with them? Right, it has to fail because of unique factorization, but what part of, um, what part of what we're about to do is going to fail? Can we just take an arbitrarily large radius and fill the whole plane? Yeah, yeah, for any ring, we could take an arbitrarily large radius and fill the whole plane. There's something very specific that's going to go wrong. It's not covering the lattice points. Well, 
um, we, we take these uh, ra like radius five circles, they're centered at all of the lattice points. So automatically you're going to cover all the lattice points because there's a circle for every lattice point. Maybe you should think of these as disks, like they're filled in. And the question is, have you filled in all of space? Yeah, these root five circles are filling all of space. The radius is too big, so we can't find a close lattice point. Daniel is hitting the uh, nail on the head. When we look at this quotient, n over m, and we find a nearby lattice point, q, so is near q, uh, let's say the nearest lattice point to n over m is q, then what did we do before? We said r is equal to, um, let's see, we're trying to solve the equation n is equal to mq plus r. So r is equal to n minus mq, which is n over m minus q times m. Nothing wrong with, with that. We take absolute values of everything and take absolute values squared. That's our nice norm function, norm of r. This is the nice norm of m. And here is where we get into trouble. So we can take larger radius circles, but when we take these larger radius circles, the price we pay is that the distance to the nearest lattice point, in fact, we don't even have to take radius, radius uh, root five circles. We all, it, all we need to take is radius a half and root five over two. If this distance is a half and this distance is root five over two, then this distance is, uh, five plus one is six. So square root of six fourths, square root of root three over two. Is that right? Can someone verify my arithmetic there? So all I'm doing is a half squared plus root five over two squared is equal to the square of this distance. And if I have that right, this is a quarter plus five quarters, which is six quarters. Whoops. Uh, so it's root three halves. So this is three halves. No, that was right. Sorry, this is three halves. So this is the square root of three halves. Anyway, the point is this is root three halves squared because it's three halves. Six fourths is three halves. Let's review this. I was doing it with my son this morning. Six fourths is three halves. And three halves is the square root of the square of three halves. And so this distance can be at worst three halves. Now there's something very bad that happens if the norm of R, if the best we can do is that the norm of R is at worst three halves the norm of N. The whole point of what we're gonna do with this division algorithm is constantly and is iterate it like like Euclidean the like Euclid's algorithm. We're going to iterate it and get smaller and smaller things until we get to zero, because what you can't go smaller and smaller in the integers without hitting zero eventually, strictly small. But this algorithm never halts because we're not getting strictly smaller. This is a number bigger than one. Now nobody says that has to be the algorithm you choose. Maybe you have some other. Whatever idea you have for how to come up with an R that has this property, well, there basically can't be anything else that has that property because it would still, uh, this is the most naive thing. It's also the most general thing you could do because if, if this equation is satisfied, then this equation is satisfied. Then the distance, you could choose a different norm. Maybe we're being stupid about the norm. Who says the complex absolute value squared should be the norm? Maybe there's some other bizarre function that we could take to be the norm, in which case we could get the norm of R to be strictly less than the norm of N. We needed no properties at all of the norm whatsoever, except that it has a division algorithm. But the point is there can't possibly be a division algorithm because then this ring would be a unique factorization domain and it's not. So let me, let me write that in words. Maybe we're using, we're not clever enough to find a good norm function.
So it need not be the norm of m is the absolute value of m squared. Nobody said that had to be the case. You can assign any norm to any uh, element of the ring, but you have to assign a norm to every element of the ring, except, except 0. So question mark. Maybe we're just not clever enough to find a good norm function. You know, maybe the norm function should be the norm of this divided by 5. Well, that won't be an integer. And anyway, it won't fix this relative problem that's relative to scaling. Um, if we could, if we could, we would get, we would prove, we would get that z adjoin i, uh, root 5i, is a unique factorization domain, but we know it's not. Okay. Is everybody um, is everybody with me? Are we we okay? We still have our our wits about us. We still have some energy. We've been at this for almost an hour. You guys need a break. Give me a thumbs up if you could use like a five minute stretch break or something. And give me a thumbs down if you just want to keep going. Okay, a couple of people could use a break. Oh, no, that was just a, do I see any thumbs up? I'm getting lots of thumbs down. All right, all right, so keep going. All right, so we'll keep going. Where were we? We're talking about rings. We're talking about division algorithm. And so remember what, the, what this division algorithm is. So the next thing we did, I'm just going to review. Maybe today is all review. No, no new stuff today. Let's review nice and slow, get our pace, figure out how to do this. So review um, is that you, if a domain is Euclidean, Euclidean domain implies it's a principal ideal domain. Okay, so this was our theorem from last time. Do you remember proving this theorem? Do you remember that we proved it? You don't have to remember the proof. Kevin has something he's going to tell us. Nope. Random question. What would be an example of a unique factorization that doesn't have a division algorithm? Um, yes, this is complicated. Uh, there are nine imaginary quadratic uh, unique factorization domains. The largest is square root of minus 163. And that, and that doesn't have a Euclidean algorithm for the same reason root minus 5 doesn't have a Euclidean algorithm. So um, let me, I'm going to come back to that question in a couple of weeks when we get to more general rings and more general algorithms and so on. But um, it's, a, it's a great question. It's a great question. In fact, not only is it a great question, it's a question of Gauss. Is the number 9 just how many have been discovered or something specific? Um, it's not something specific in that... Yes, there have been nine that have been discovered, and there's a very uh, beautiful long story about why uh, now we know that nine is the final answer. Uh, there's nothing special about the number nine. It's just an accident of uh, humanity or mathematics or something, whatever you want to call it, uh, that there happened to be nine. But the fact that there's nine, uh, the, the existence of those nine was known to Gauss, and Gauss conjectured that those were the only ones. And the proof that Gauss's conjecture is correct is this incredible story that I would love to have time to get into. And uh, we would need a whole lot more technology to talk about. But if you look at the class number one problem, this is related to, okay, so if you want to, if you want to think about these, these guys, look up the class number one problem. Class number one problem. In fact, we will talk about this. We're going to get to uh, class numbers 
and equivalence classes of quadratic forms and discriminants and stuff like that. And so I'll be able to explain to you why uh, having class number one is related, is equivalent to being a unique factorization domain. And then uh, what that has to do with um, the fact that there are these unique factorization domains that are not um, Euclidean domains. Okay. So Kevin, I promise I will get to your answer. Sarah, the reason there's nine, there's no good reason for it to be, for nine to be the answer, but nine is now known to be the exact answer. There are nine known and we know that there are no more. Um, that's by the way, just for imaginary quadratic fields, for real quadratic fields. So instead of uh, a square root of minus five, which gives us complex numbers, if we took Z adjoined square root of five, that gives us real numbers. That's another field, and we're, we're going to talk about that one too. That has to do with uh, something called the Pell equation, which we will discuss. Uh, you know, everything, uh, hopefully, hopefully we'll get to this. So, um, and there, the expectation is that infinitely many uh, fields are unique factorization domain. Infinite, infinitely many real quadratic fields are unique factorization domain. So there's... You guys are stepping on, you're asking awesome questions because these are like the juiciest, still unsolved problems in uh, number theory. So we will get to those. Can I, yeah, and for the Euclidean algorithm, isn't that just the principal ideal generated by GC? Exactly, exactly. So why is this, yes, so why is this, what's the proof? If we have a Euclidean algorithm, let's look at a principal ideal. Let's look at it. Uh, so my claim, my claim is that if you look at the ideal in the ideal generated by two elements, let's say N and M, N and M are in your ring, and you have a Euclidean domain, my claim is that uh, if this ideal is generated by two elements, then the ideal is generated by a single element and that element and D is a greatest common divisor of N and M. Okay, and once you can do this for two elements, it's easy to uh, do it for, for more. So let's, um, let's remember how we did this. There, there's a bunch of terminology. There's a, it's a good way to, uh, let, let's review a little bit of the terminology, okay? Before we go into the proof of this. So recall terminology, terminology. Um, remember what a unit is? What's a unit? Can everybody write in the chat what a unit is? A unit, U in R. Yes. Yes. Has V in R such that U times V is equal to one. And did we, did I give you the exercise that the set of units forms a group? Yes. Okay. So recall, then I can say recall instead of exercise. And again, I hope you saw my email. So homework is now optional, but you should still, you know, do it and learn from it. And it could easily make its way to exams. Um, recall that the set of units, this is the set of U in R that are units, forms a group. It's very easy to see. If u is a unit, so is v, because this equation is symmetric. Uh, the product of two units, well, we have our, our rings are commutative. And so, um, but actually in general, well, you have to say, okay, let's not talk about non-commutative rings. You have to worry about left units and right units and left multiplication and right multiplication. We're, we're dealing with commutative rings. Keep it simple. Um, so it is a group. So if you have two units, their product will also be a unit because you can multiply by the product of the inverses and that'll be another element of the ring. Um, 
That's what it means to be a unit. Two elements are um, associate. Do I want to say something else first? No, two elements are associate. Our definition, R and S, A and B, let's say A and B. A and B in the ring are associate, are associates if Yeah, exactly. If A equals B times a unit, okay. And the nicer way to say this in terms of ideals, Exactly. The ideal generated by A is the same thing as the ideal generated by B. Okay? That's what it means to be associates. Let's talk about, uh, let me recall irreducible elements. R in R is irreducible if R equals S times T, S and T in the ring, imply. Um, good, uh, good thought, um, but two times th two and three are co-prime, and two times three is six, and we don't want to call six irreducible. So it's not enough to say S and T are co-prime. We want to know that, think about, I mean, this definition came from our, our uh, thoughts about prime numbers, and prime numbers, a number is a prime if when you multiply, well, if it has no divisors except one in itself. So let's think about that definition. That's that turns out to be not the right definition for primality, as we saw in this z adjoint root minus five. Yes, exactly. If s is a unit, then either s is a unit or s is an associate. So any divisor of an irreducible is either basically that divisor or a unit. Okay, and that definition is in contradistinction with being prime what does it mean to be prime Everybody's typing out their answer. Take your time. Great. Great. A lot of great answers. Sri has got it on the nose. If P divides A times B, then P divides A or P divides B. So there's a so there's a lot of uh, other ways that people express this. Yes, exactly. Uh, if P is in the an equivalent way of saying this is if P is in the ideal generated by A times B, right? Remember what the ideal generated by A times B. It's all multiples of A and B. Other way around, right? Oh, I I, I just misread what you wrote. Um, this means that P times somebody is AB. In other words, 
a times b is in the ideal generated by p implies already a or b is in the ideal generated by p. Okay? If a times b is a multiple of p, in other words, p divides a, a times b, then either p already divides a or p already divides b. Okay? Does everybody, you guys remember these kind of abstract-ish things? Um, let me give you a uh, example. Example. Right, well, we had, we had seen these examples before. Um, recall, we won't redo the calculation, but recall that two in z adjoin root minus five is irreducible but not prime. It's irreducible. We checked that if you have two, if you write two as a product of two things, then either that one of those things is a unit or one of those things is associated to two in this ring. And why isn't it prime? Because two divides six, which is one plus root minus five times one minus root minus five. And two does not divide one plus or minus root minus five. And this again, you check by trying, trying to write it out. Okay. Now prime doesn't imply irreducible. I think we proved, did we prove that last time? Let me, let me just, in the interest of time, state it as an exercise. And it's possible I already gave it to you as an exercise, in which case you just, have to do it again. Let's see. This is exercise one. Exercise one, P is prime, implies T is irreducible. Okay? Oh, Kevin's question. P could divide both A and B. Yes, it could divide both A and B. This is not exclusive or. Could divide both A and B, but at least one of A or B. Uh, is already a multiple of p. If p divides at least one of a or b. It could divide both. So let me put here, or both. Okay? Um, that is irreducible elements and prime elements and associate elements. And we talked about the ideal versions of these things. Um, did we prove that in a principal ideal domain? Let, let me make this exercise two. I think we did this already. Exercise two. If R is a principal ideal domain, then irreducible if and only if prime. Did we do this already? Can I get a thumbs up if we did it or not? I don't think so. Okay, good. So this is an exercise. So this is an exercise. So one direction, I think we did already that anytime you have a prime, it is irreducible. In a principal ideal domain, if you're irreducible, then you're prime. I'm gonna let you think about that one. I'm gonna let you think about that one. Um, Sarah had a question. Let me just read it for a second. By irreducible, meaning that other than one, nothing else can define it. Right. In general, it would be no, nothing other than one, but um, being a unit is much more than just being one. So I should have done an example back here. Let's see. Um, example in the ring, some field. Let me make that. Let me not make this abstract. Uh, in the ring, the reals adjoin X. What is the units? Which polynomials in the real numbers are invertible? So if I take two polynomials, I can multiply those two polynomials together. I'll get another polynomial. When is that polynomial one? Or for which polynomials do I have inverses? Right. Yukon. Right. 
degree zero polynomials that are not the zero polynomial itself. So it's just the real numbers take away zero. Okay? So, um, so that's what's interesting about this irreducibility condition. It's much more than just a number is irreducible if it's, if it's only divisors are one in itself. Here we have uncountably many divisors of every polynomial. And yet we know what it means for a polynomial to be irreducible. It can't be written as, uh, you know, it can't be factored into smaller polynomials. Now, um, well, okay, let's just do one more example. So is uh, the polynomial x squared plus one irreducible? Can I get a thumbs up if you say yes and a thumbs down if you say no? Thumbs up if x squared plus one is irreducible and thumbs down if you say if, if, uh, if it's not irreducible? I see a bunch of thumbs up and a bunch of thumbs down. And all of you are correct because I haven't specified appropriately the ring. Well, I guess maybe it's implied that the previous ring applies. So in the reals, yes, it is irreducible. Irreducible. In the complexes, in the complex numbers, not irreducible, of course since x squared plus one decomposes as x plus i times x minus i. Does that make sense? So you have to be a little careful. You have to be a lot careful, especially with, with questions about which polynomials are irreducible. What ring are you talking about? How about, ooh, this is a good one, exercise. Ooh, this is a really good one. Please do this exercise if you want to understand irreducibility is x squared plus one irreducible in um, the field z mod five a join x so let's parse this so this is our field k is now z mod five Z mod five, five is a prime, so Z mod five is a field. You remember that? So this is a field, is a field. It has, its elements are invertible. Can you find two polynomials whose product is X squared plus one in this field? And when you're done with that, do exercise three, uh, exercise four um, is x squared plus one irreducible in um, z mod seven adjoin x. Whoops. Why is it important that five is a five a, a prime? If five is not a prime, then so in z mod six you can still talk about irreducibles. There's nothing wrong with talking about irreducibles. But z mod 6 adjoin x does not have a division algorithm because z mod 6 itself is not a field. And so there are already elements that are not invertible in this ring. And so when you try to do the division algorithm, you might get stuck and the degree might not strictly decrease. So um, that's another good exercise. But maybe I'll just say that one verbally and let you guys uh, think about that. Well, all right, fine, fine. How about in Z mod six, I join X. Play with that too, play with that too. Uh, it might or it might not. Ah, okay, I know the answer. And you will know the answer too. Once you see these three examples, you will see the close relation between this question and the question that motivated our entire discussion, which is uh, when are numbers sums of two squares? So um, we're going to come back to that. All right. So I think that's enough. You guys have been amazing. I think you uh, have lasted an entire hour 